Vitamin K has come a long way from what we learned in school. So we're going to look at some of the clinical aspects. 75% of the vitamin K that is used by the body is produced in the intestinal tract by friendly bacteria. 25% comes from the diet. Vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. Therefore, vitamin K absorption does depend on a healthy liver and a healthy gallbladder. Unlike other fat-soluble vitamins, however, it is not stored in the body. And this is new information. Most of us, when we trained, were trained that vitamin K was stored. It is not. Recent studies have shown that more vitamin K is needed than previously thought, as especially as one ages. Vitamin K occurs in two natural forms. Vitamin K1, which is derived from dietary sources, and vitamin K2, which is produced by bacteria in the intestine. There is vitamin K3. This is mostly synthetic. A small amount can be made from vitamin K1. This is mostly used in chemotherapy. It literally potentiates the cytotoxic activity of some of the chemotherapeutic agents and vitamin C, so that's consequently why it's used in oncology. It is an alkylating agent, it's a thiol depleting agent, and so it promotes the production of reactive oxygen species and it depletes the body of glutathione. Vitamin K3 is very toxic and the FDA has banned its use in supplements. Uh, they use it in animals but not in pets and otherwise it's used in chemotherapy. The body does need more vitamin K2 than it produces in the intestinal tract. Some of the K1 will become K2. Humans can develop a deficiency of vitamin K in as little as seven days. So it's very amazing. If you're not intaking any vitamin K, your gut's not making any, you can become deficient very quickly. Vitamin K is involved in five main processes in the body. Blood coagulation, bone mineralization, vascular health and elasticity, cell signaling and cancer prevention, and brain cell protection. Vitamin K, when we look at it as a cofactor, it converts glutamate into gamma carboxyglutamate. This GLA or gamma carboxyglutamate containing protein regulates many of the processes controlled by calcium. Gamma carboxyglutamate or gamma carboxy, uh, carboxylation by vitamin K activates GLA protein molecules that are needed for coagulation. So literally it's a pro-coagulant. Vitamin K promotes the gamma carboxylation of anticoagulant proteins like protein C and proteins S. Low levels of protein C and S can lead to increased coagulation in the blood vessels and abnormal clotting. Protein C pathway, by the way, is an anti-inflammatory pathway. If you look at vitamin K and bone mineralization, osteocalcin, the chief bone matrix protein, is a GLA protein. It's dependent on vitamin K to be produced. So low levels of vitamin K impairs the activity of osteocalcin, and so therefore it decreases the activity of the bone-forming cells. Animal studies have shown that vitamin K activated osteocalcin is involved in pancreatic B cell proliferation. So glucose tolerance, uh, glucose or insulin sensitivity, and it increases the production of adiponectin. So vitamin K does stimulate osteocalcin. Since osteocalcin is dependent on the available amount of vitamin K, a deficiency may result in a higher risk for weight gain, because adiponectin is involved in the patient's weight, along with type 2 diabetes. There's a lot of studies now on vitamin K and bone health. In anti-aging medicine, we want to maintain vision, memory, and mobility. Let's face it, if you're 100 years of age, you know who you are, what you are, where you are. You can see, you can get around, you're not old. If you can't do those things when you're 60, you are. 
So what maintains vision, memory, and mobility is what we look at. For bone structure, mobility, vitamin K is very, very important. Low intake of vitamin K has been associated with bone loss. This trial is also showing that it's been very effective in preventing and treating osteoporosis. We've been doing a lot of this in our practice. What we're moving away from is using bisphosphonate type of medications. It's not that I don't write prescriptions for those. We do. But we try and reserve that for patients that have immobility problems. The bisphosphonates have been associated with two things. Number one, an issue where the bone structure is not as strong if a bisphosphonate is given. Number two, sometimes, and not that often, rarely, what will happen is you can get necrosis of the jawbone with bisphosphonate use. So we're looking more and more at what we can do. And the studies have been showing that having the patient hormonally sound and nutritionally sound with things like vitamin K builds strong bone, much stronger bone than medications will build. Recent study has shown that vitamin K intake on a daily basis must be at least 100 micrograms to, re to maintain optimal bone structure. Very important to remember 100 micrograms because we're going to come back to an issue why that is very key. If you look at vascular health and vitamin K, GLA proteins in the blood vessel walls decrease vascular calcification. So now we're finding a benefit here as well with vitamin K. Vitamin K dependent GLA proteins also have been shown to prevent calcification following an injury in the wall vessel itself. So again, very important.